Good to see everybody. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Hey, would you do me a big favor and put your hands together and welcome our online community? God bless you guys. Thank you for those of you who are joining us from home today. We're so glad that you take time out of your day to be a part of Journey Church, even if it is virtually this morning. The past week has been an amazing one at Journey. So many great memories. We did baptisms and the picnic last weekend. How many of you got to go there? If you did, put your hands together a little bit. Many of you got to go out there. Always a great time in Green Cove Springs. Um, got to see some of the time hop on Facebook of many of the past events that we had did over the years. Brought back such good memories. Even Rob, Rob and I were reminiscing 10 plus years ago. Rob was leading with his wife a group called I Marriage, and they did the I Marriage Olympics this week. So I hope that 10 years from now, if the Lord should tarry and allow me to look back, I'll see your faces on my time hop doing some crazy things over the years as part of Journey Church. Why don't we pray and get into God's word? Lord, we thank you. We praise you and we give you glory. You truly are our God and King, and we've gathered together in this place to worship you, exalt your name, and give you all the glory that is due. Today, as we gather together, I ask you to touch our hearts and touch our minds. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? But even more so, would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives? In Jesus' name, and everybody says... Hey, so when I last spoke a few weeks ago, we were doing the Jesus Story series, and we're continuing on in that again this morning. And I spoke about the resurrection or the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I talked about how miracles truly are extraordinary. Now, we all know some people who are a little bit extra. That's not what I'm talking about here today. I'm talking about these extraordinary miracles, these stories that sound too good to be true, but actually are true. Do you believe what the Word of God says? Do you believe it's for you today? Hey, then I guess I came to the right place. We could get on with our preaching today. It led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole as I studied that subject and found at least seven other instances in the Bible where I could see that people were raised from the dead. There could be more. I didn't do an in-depth study, but those were the seven that I could find, right? I want to walk through a couple of them today and really build a little bit on the last message that I did, and then I want to hone in on something, a very important distinction. I want to talk about the difference of being raised from the dead and being resurrected from the dead. There is a huge difference between the two that is really life-changing, and I hope you grasp it this morning. So one of the first stories you see of someone being raised from the dead is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 in the Old Testament. Elijah the prophet, man, he is one of my favorite people in the Bible to read about. He truly did have an extraordinary life. God used him to do some powerful and amazing things. And as you get to the setup of this story, he finds himself out at a brook, right? There's a a river that's there. And he had commanded, God gave him the power to command whether it would rain or not on his word. Could you imagine that kind of power and anointing on your life? So for over three years, there's no rain that's going down. Now, in modern day society, we have Uber Eats. Have any of you ever taken advantage of Uber Eats? A few of you in here, use, I live in the country, you ain't got no Uber Eats out there, man. You got to drive wherever you got to go to go get it, right? So this was, God invented Uber Eats, right? So he had the ravens come and actually feed Elijah where he was at. But then all of a sudden, the brook begins to dry up, and it's time for Elijah to move on. God moves him to a widow's house who has a young man there, and she gets there, or her son, right? So he gets there, and she's on her last bit of food, right? And he tells her, like, I want you to give me this food, right? How many of you on your last bit of food, some strange prophet shows up, and then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, I'm going to give you the food, right? But she sensed something of him that he was from God. So she did it. She did what the prophet said. She welcomed him into her home. And then she ends up experiencing a miracle where the food just kept going on and on and on and on. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? We're talking about some crazy stuff here. How many of you would like to go to your refrigerator? You open it up, you eat it, you go back, you close it, you come back, and it's full again without even having to go up to Publix, right? 
God is an amazing God who is a provider, right? During the course of his stay, though, sadly, her son ends up dying. How must she have felt at that moment? God, did you keep me alive for this? And she actually says, and has a few choice words for Elijah and for God for a couple moments there. Like, God, why, why is this happening? Why is my son died? Did all this happen? And then my son ends up dying? How would you feel in that particular moment, right? But she stands up in faith. And Elijah stands up in faith. And Elijah does something very strange. It says that he goes in 1 Kings 17, 20, he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let the boy's life return back to him. And guess what? It did. Hallelujah, Jesus. You don't look like you believe that story. Do you guys believe that story? I've been talking about these extraordinary stories here from God's word. I said, don't take them as normal. Do you believe what we're reading today? If you do, give me an amen. Amen, right? Amazing. Church, there's no doubt in your own life today, there may be some dead things, some dead areas that you're believing God to bring back to life. I'm asking you to have faith today. I'm asking you to continue to hear me out. May these stories that I'm sharing with you build your faith that if God can raise someone from the dead, he could do anything in your life, right? If he can accomplish the impossible, guess what? Whatever situation you're going through, he can turn your circumstances around. The next story we find is one of Elisha, Elijah's protege. 2 Kings 4, starting around verse 8, is the story of the faithful Shunammite woman and her husband who extend grace to Elisha, right? The first miracle that occurs there is she is barren. And she's believing God for a son, but she has no child. Then Elisha prays, and all of a sudden, she gets pregnant. How amazing is that? Man, I just keep being amazed and blown away. Each one of these things is crazy when you start to think about it. So she ends up getting pregnant, ends up having a boy. Sometime later, probably many years later, that boy ends up dying. Here we are again, much like the widow. All of a sudden, God... You gave me this miracle, now my son is dead. What the heck is going on? But somewhere deep down she had faith. She remembered that Elisha had empowered by God to go and touch her, so to speak, so that she would have that baby. So she calls for Elisha. And Elisha ends up coming, and Elisha does something very similar to what Elijah did with that other son. And he prays for him, and then it says this. 2 Kings 4.35, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. He came back from the dead. How crazy is that? Is your faith being built today? I certainly hope so. Because these stories are foreshadowing of what's to come. As you begin to open up the New Testament... We begin to see Jesus' story after Jesus' story, miracle after miracle, where he, like Elijah and Elisha, has compassion on people. In particular, one of the unique things about all these stories is there's a family in distress. Whenever something is dying in your life, whenever something is troubled in your life, it doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody around you, right? If you're an addict and you're in this place and you think, well, I'm gonna do what I want to do because I could do it and it's not hurting anybody else, let me tell you, it's hurting everybody around you. Everybody around you sees that pain. If you're struggling, and you're part of a family, which we all are, right? Then guess what? It affects everybody around you. We don't live in isolation. And Elisha saw the pain in those mother's eyes. Elijah saw the pain in that mother's eyes. Jesus, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, saw the pain in his sister's eyes, right? And if there's pain in your eyes today, he sees that pain as well. He won't let it go unchallenged. He won't let it go by the wayside. He loves you just that much. The first story you see of a resurrection or really someone being raised from the dead is the one of Lazarus in the New Testament. If you missed that message from a couple weeks ago, I encourage you to go back there and read it. There's actually two other stories of Jesus raising other people from the dead. Matthew 9, 18 through 25 Jesus raises the ruler's daughter from the dead. Luke 7, 11 through 17, Jesus raises a widow's son and Nain from the dead. 
All these stories I shared with you so far and two more that I will share with you are about people being raised from the dead. But guess what? The next story you encounter in the New Testament is Jesus being raised from the dead, right? There's something altogether different about that story because it isn't about Jesus being raised from the dead. It's about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. There's a big distinction between the two. You see, if you are raised from the dead, guess what? You are going to die an earthly death again. There's going to still be that appointment date waiting for you later where you're going to sit at the judgment seat of Christ, right? When you're resurrected from the dead, you die no more. You are alive for all eternity at that point, right? We need to explore that a little bit more. That's the distinction of what happened with Jesus. He was resurrected from the dead. And if you believe that, it changes everything. Everything changes on that knowledge. Do you get the distinction? I'll build upon it. Here's something beautiful. Resurrection from the dead is the promise for all who believe. I'll bring you back to a conversation that Jesus had with Mary regarding Lazarus from a couple of weeks ago, John 11, 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, key thing right here, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you, church, believe this? Our faith hinges upon that statement. Do you believe this? It is the hope of all. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has implications for all of us. The hope of our salvation is dependent on his words there being true. By the way, they are true. Hallelujah. I'll circle back to that before we close. I want to share something else that's crazy ludicrous with you today. Something just crazy. I can't believe it's even in God's word. If you are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit then I am here to tell you that today God's miracle working power is at work in and through you. Don't look to your neighbor. Don't look to the person on the left or to the right because as my wife reminds me from sometimes, when we preach, sometimes we think it's for the person sitting next to us. I said, God's miracle working power is in you. So I want you to say, me. Me. Not your neighbor, but if they're saved, it is in them too, hallelujah. (laughs) But it's for you. We need to internalize that. We need to receive it. When we see God at work doing extraordinary things, it's not just meant to be in the lives of others. It's meant to flow through you as well. God's Holy Spirit is inside of you for those of you who believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, John 14, 12 says this. Jesus says to his disciples, truly, truly, I say to you that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Do you really get that? Why have we accepted less in Christianity then? Why are we content to walk in a world where we don't see miracles? Yet in today's day and age, the demons are getting darker and more devilish, are they not? They're abounding all the more. Do you not think we need the supernatural power of God to combat the wiles of the enemy in our generation? That verse would begin to be manifest later on in the book of Acts and would continue on into our own generation. God begins to pour out his spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. Why did he say he would do more? I think it was because his physical body was contained at that particular moment to the people that he could reach and touch. By empowering us with the same Holy Spirit that was at work in him, now just think of this room. How many people do you go out there and interact with on an everyday basis? Multiply that times the millions of believers who are around the world, and now we can do a whole lot, right? 
we can go out there and reach a whole lot of people with the gospel. Hallelujah. During Peter's first sermon after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he boldly declares the following in Acts 2.17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy, right? Do you think we're in the last days? I've been hearing about the last days from the day I got saved. How about you? The rapture's coming, this is coming, that's coming. But let me tell you, as I gaze upon the things that are out there, I've never seen the darkness as I have today. I mean, it is definitively being multiplied. And all the conversations of those rapture promises and things of that, when I was coming up 25 years ago as a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the things that they discounted was the amount of darkness that would be coming in that generation. And I truly believe we're approaching that time, that season right now where Jesus could come at any time. The darkness abounds. The light must abound all the more. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, he echoes similar words to what Peter said and what Jesus said in his great commission to us. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and be baptized will be saved. Stop there. That's all we do, right? No, we're done. No, it goes on. There's more stuff after that particular comma. But whoever does not believe will be condemned, sadly. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. That is the fullness of the gospel being poured out in our own generation. I've witnessed it. I've seen it. You have too. May we embrace it. May we move in it. May we watch what God does with it. Lord, I pray those verses over the people of Journey Church right now, that there would be a reality in your life, that you would grasp the call that is on your life, and that you would move in it. Church, how can we read words like that and not get excited? How can we read words like that and go back to cappuccino Christianity light? I don't know that I can. Hopefully you can't either. Just as Elijah and Elisha were a foreshadowing of what is to come, I believe that what happened during the early church is a depiction of what will happen in the last days before Jesus returns. Look what happened just a little bit later on in the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, 36. This is a Jesus story still, even though it is being manifest through the believers. In this case, Peter. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in the upstairs room. Lydia was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydia, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Ladies, I think you have a very special place in what God is doing even in this season. I think of all of these stories, and sadly, only one was initiated by a man. Every other one, the Shulamite woman, the widow, now Lydia, others, all of them are initiated by a woman crying out for someone else. What did they expect Peter to do? Tabitha's dead. When people die, they don't typically come back from the dead. Why are you going to bother Peter? Because the miracle working power of God was at work inside of Peter. And when Peter showed up, everything changed. She was raised from the dead. Guys, we got to continue to do those Monday nights. We got to continue to build our faith. We got to step up there with those women. But ladies, we appreciate every prayer, every act of service, everything that you do. Would you give it up for the ladies in the room right now? (laughs) Hallelujah, Jesus. One slash 1.5 stories I've got left to tell you of someone being raised from the dead. Acts 9.39. This is for those of you who are being put to sleep by my message today. Luckily, you're not sitting in a third floor window. If you fall asleep, someone might draw on your face, but you're not about to fall out and die. (laughs) Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. 
All the widows stood around him and cried, showing him the robes and other clothing. Of, oh, that's a continuation of that one story. I apologize. We've got to skip on to the next. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was in a sound asleep, he fell to the ground in the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Do not be alarmed, he said, he is alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. I share those two stories in addition to the other Jesus stories as an active demonstration that it wasn't just Jesus who did these miracles. It was the other believers who were doing exactly what was said in Mark as part of the Great Commission. And it's the same thing that God wants to do through you if you would be so bold as to believe these words in our own generation. There, I said 1.5. Um, in Acts chapter 14, there's a scene where Paul himself is beaten and stoned. Now, when people get stoned, they typically get stoned to death, right? I'm not get, talking about this kind of stoned. I'm talking about the kind of stoned where they're throwing rocks at them, right? People knew what they were doing. When, so they dragged him out of the city as for dead, it said. I would not be shocked. This is speculation on my particular one on this one. So don't take this as definitive theology. I would, it says that the believers gathered around him and prayed and he got up and ended up being fine and walked back into the city and started preaching again. I honestly would not be shocked if that was another one where he was actually raised from the dead, to be honest with you. Either that or he was definitively severely injured and, and immediately got back up and went back into the city to continue to preach. God is a good and grateful God. Hallelujah. I share all of these stories to give you hope, but also as a call to action. I espouse to you once again that that power is at work in you, that God wants you to cast out demons. God wants you to heal the sick. God wants you to maybe even be a part of experiencing someone being raised from the dead. And he certainly wants you to share your faith with the hope that someone else will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Will you have a chance to raise somebody from the dead? I do not know. But we live in the last days, and this I know, God is pouring out his spirit in our generation. And we are called to be like John the Baptist, to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. To boldly preach, yes, again, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to share the good news of the gospel with those who are hurting, and to bring people to the foot of the cross that they might encounter Jesus and surrender their lives to him. Church, go and change lives. I want to close by challenging you with Paul's words to the Corinthian church. He does a much better job of explaining the difference between being raised from the dead and being resurrected from the dead than I could ever do, right? The gospel is sufficient. You don't need my commentary on it, right? Let's read a few of his words to really bring this home. If you want to close your eyes and absorb it, if you just want to soak it in, whatever works for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. This gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. What is he talking about? What is the gospel that he preached to them? What do they have to hold on to that they might not believe in vain? It says, for what I received, I passed on to you as a matter of first importance. When it says it's a matter of first importance, what does that mean? It's a matter of first importance. <laughs> it's pretty plain. What was the matter of first importance to the believer? that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living at the time of that writing, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. I don't know why he wrote that particular part. 
But do you get the picture? What is the matter of first importance? That Jesus lived a sinless, spotless death, was born of a virgin Mary, that he died in your place for your sins, but most importantly, that he was resurrected from the dead, that he was seen alive. At least pastor's wife is excited. I don't know about you. That is reason to be excited, right? That's the matter of first importance. That's what's worth fighting for. He goes on to say, for I'm the least of the apostles and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, the grace of God that is within me, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. And there's an importance of holding to those truths, right? But at the same time, he's also saying that, guess what? Your past, if it is the past, does not disqualify you. If you have been saved, your sins are covered. You are forgiven. Don't let the devil continue to hold you back. Be washed from those things and begin to move forward. He was a Christian killer who was used by God to continue to change lives even into our own generation. Now, if you're active in your sin and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's a different story, right? You need to repent. You need to ask God for help. You need to change. You need to allow him to work within you. If you're struggling in this place today, there's nothing wrong with saying, I need help. Lord, would you change me? Nothing is impossible for God. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, raised, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. That's the point I was making to you earlier. All of Christianity hinges on these truths that I'm sharing with you today. More than that, We are found to be false witnesses for God. For if we have testified that God, he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And Christ has not been raised. Your faith is futile for you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, We are the people to be most pitied if this is not true, right? If you've given up everything and it's not true, but let me tell you, it is true. It's true. It's true. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. You can go on living. You're going to live forever if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're going to get to spend eternity with him. Death has no sting. He has defeated hell, death, and the grave. But guess what? If Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the old Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as Adam in, in all died, so in Christ we will all be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is, can you read it? Death. Death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that that does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. He's talking about the dominion and authority of God the father and the relationship with God the son there. So it does get a little bit technical in there. One last short thing to read. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, as surely as I boast about Christ, Jesus is our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? The dead are not raised. 
let us eat and drink for tomorrow we'll die. He's talking about the modern day saying YOLO, you only live once, right? He's talking about if this isn't true, you might as well go out there and sin all you can. You might as well go out there and no rules apply. You could do whatever you want. And isn't that what the world tells us today? You could do what you want. You could live the way that you want. You don't have to um, care for others. You don't have to care for yourself. God is not real. That means you could do anything you want. That's not true. Maybe God's working on your heart today and maybe you've been living that way. It's okay if you confess, if you repent. He concludes with the following words. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Would you rise with me and bow your heads for a moment? There's a couple different audiences for this message today. First and foremost, if you're here and you've never made a decision to turn your life over to Jesus or today's a day where you need to rededicate your life to him, this is your moment. There's also a challenge in it for those who believe to live like it, to surrender everything and go after it to serve, to give, to go all out, to spread the good news of the gospel for if this is true and this is what we rest our faith upon, then it's worth dying for is what Paul intimated in what we just read. There's probably a third group of you who are here today that have some area of your life that is in need of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It could be a relationship, it could be a sickness, it could be freedom from some sort of habitual sin. Altar team, I'd ask you to come on up to the front if you would as well. So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed for just a minute, is today a day where you just know in your heart that you need to either dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ? If it is, I would love to personally pray with you. If that's you, I'd ask you to acknowledge that by simply raising your hand up real high so I could see it so I know who I'm praying for. I see your hand and your hand, sir. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I see your hand over here on the right-hand side. Yeah, Journey, rejoice.